Okay, we are joined now by the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of the Republic of South Africa, Mukhweng Mukhweng, who's given us a bit of his time as we look back at where the country has been over the past 25 years of our democracy, particularly with the Chief Justice. We'll be trying to unpack and understand where is the judiciary at today, 2019, since 1994. What are some of its key challenges today and what can be done differently going forward? But because he's a leader of society, besides being chief justice, we'll also tap into some of his insights, some of his thinking about some of the challenges that our country is facing. For example, many people argue today that the moral fabric of South Africa has been damaged. Does he have a view on things like that? But first up, welcome, Chief Justice. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Moyani, for allowing me to to have a thing or two to say about our country. Let's start with the state of the judiciary. What is your assessment of the judiciary today? For example, because this is topical, are any aspects of it captured, for example, or vulnerable to capture or corruption? I think it will take an extraordinarily weak and corrupt judge or magistrate to be captured, particularly at the level of the higher judiciary, which comprises judges, because unlike members of any arm of the state, we're the only ones who retire with our full salaries, provided you've served for about 20 years, and as those in active service increase a salary raise, receive a salary raise, you, you receive yours from home. So what possible reason would any principled person be weakened by the desire for more to the point of compromising principles that are so fundamental to the sustenance of South Africa as a constitutional democracy? So very, very slim possibility of that happening. I won't say it can't happen. There is always that human weakness but broadly speaking, it's most unlikely that judges could be captured. So are you telling us that as we sit in 2019, as far as you are aware, the judges have not been captured? The judiciary as a collective has not been captured. I can't vouch for every individual, but I can confidently say the overwhelming majority of judges are incapable of being captured. If there be any exception, I doubt if you will you will count up to five. Yeah, a few weeks ago at the Judicial Services Commission, while we were interviewing for some of the position for for, for judges, you raised the issue yourself yes. of the possibility of people being captured or thinking they are more than what they are. Sure. You raised the issue of you think if people are praised as being yes. the best, yes. they might weaken. Do you still hold that view? Of course I do. Let me tell you how, and this is a global phenomenon. You simply have to identify what people like the most to get to them. If it is money they love, you explore the possibility of giving them money. If it is fame they like, you dangle the carrot of significant publicity. If it is power, you also dangle the possibility of some undeserved elevation in their position. In a number of jurisdictions, and I have interacted with many jurisdictions globally, there are, there are jurisdictions where judges are simply corrupt and everybody knows about it. And I made an effort to trace what is it that facilitated this undesirable outcome. The weaknesses of people were exploited and unfortunately in those jurisdictions circumstances permitted that to happen. Overpraising, underpayment are some of the avenues that we're taking full advantage of to corrupt. Are our judges currently well paid? We are fairly well paid. It's never enough for any human being but I think we, the state has gone out of its way to make us comfortable. Now, another issue that comes up with the judiciary, besides the potential of, of being corrupted 
or being captured is an issue of fairness. I mean, the law is a, is a very cold instrument, as some people say. The law is just what it is. It is the law. But do you believe that our judiciary today, in major, major cases, on all the other cases, are acting in a fair way, are treating the people who are in the dock in a fair way? Broadly speaking, they are. But I have some reason to believe that we need to do more in terms of facilitating the entrenchment of our core values, our constitutional values and norms. Because you do come across some cases where the law as it used to be has been applied with little regard to the constitution that ought to permeate every, every um, area of the law. So we need to do more to conscientize colleagues at every level about the supremacy of the Constitution and that before you take any decision, just pause and reflect on how the Constitution finds application in that matter. Besides the fairness part, there's the other side to fairness, which is access to justice. Sure. We know that the majority of South Africans remain poor, sure. unemployed, and we live in the most unequal society. What do you think can be done, or are we doing enough to provide access to justice for our people? I think the state has uh, done its best in the circumstances considering that it doesn't have unlimited resources. But I think we inadvertently created access to justice challenges through our competition law system. When I was a, a practicing advocate, there, there were parameters within which you could charge but I was subsequently led to believe, while I was a judge already, that the competition uh, law regime ruled that out as being anti-competitive, with the result that people started charging amounts that make you shiver at times. I remember we had one occasion as the Constitutional Court to reduce fees that had been charged by advocates. And most South Africans are either unemployed or have limited resources to litigate. So if litigation is inaccessible to even most of those who are employed, then we've got an access to justice challenge because you cannot effectively prosecute your, your case without the intervention of legal representation. I mean, organizations like the Legal Aid, for instance, they do their part. We have some sure. pro bono organizations sure. who have law clinics at universities, sure. but it's still not enough. No, it is not enough, particularly because you do find a situation where, though represented by people from these structures, the person on the other side or a company on the other side is represented by senior counsel of many years of experience and a number of, uh, of highly skilled junior counsel. So what chance do you stand with one legal representative who is at a fairly junior level against those people? What we often do is to appeal to the general counsel of the bar to make freely available to cases that we believe are deserving of uh, representation at a higher level senior counsel for free to uh, people who are, in our view, underrepresented. Those are the what about the rural communities? I mean, access to many services, let alone the legal uh, service, we, we know that in our country is a challenge. From the judiciary perspective, do you think we're doing enough to provide access uh, for rural people? I think there was a Foundation for Human Rights report recently, you may not yes. be aware of it, which really highlighted the question of access to justice for our rural communities. It's very difficult. I, I often cite my experience when I first went to Idujwa. I had uh, the meeting with a the kin there, and he shared with me the frustrations that his people are exposed to because of the distance between the village and the magistrate's court in town and the absence of public transportation and how people often miss their court days because they had no mode of transportation to take them to town. But here is the bottom line. There is an inexplicably st stiff opposition to restructuring the traditional court system in a manner that would cause them to be consistent 
with the constitution in their operations. I don't understand why. I don't understand why it was possible to restructure the colonial court system that we used to have. That explains why so many people died, so many people were discriminated against. And yet, we have some reason to believe that the African justice system and its institutions are so horrible that all they are about is oppressing women and nothing good can come out of them. I think a properly restructured traditional court system that is made um, constitutionally compliant will make justice incredibly accessible to the rural communities because the laws applied there and the procedures are the laws and the procedures they know. They didn't even have to go to school to understand them. And all you have to do is mind your business in the morning and walk to the traditional court that is restructured in that manner to access justice. And two, you also have uh, what they call community justice centers. They, there are a few of them in South Africa already. Well-trained people, highly capacitated, that have made access to justice amazingly um, 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 available to, to people. I think that, coupled with the mediation system that we are on the verge of introducing in the South African uh, justice system, will make justice accessible to all. But the, the traditional courts amendment bill, it's still stuck somewhere in parliament. Yes. Uh, National Assembly passed it yes. and, uh, recently. Yes. And there were accusations of politicking around it because of electioneering rather, because or, or using it as an election ploy. Yes. But um, the National Council of Provinces has yet to discuss it from what I understand. Sure. And the new parliament after the elections might revisit it. Are you therefore saying in relation to that, if it is properly amended to align with the constitution, its critics, those who say the rights of women in rural areas will be trampled upon further, that in some cases, one individual, a traditional chief, will have all the power. Yes. Are you saying they have nothing to worry about? Uh, I'm not even, I'm not even uh, talking about the traditional court bill, which I've deliberately decided not to, to read. I'm saying we've got to reflect on the African traditional justice system, including the courts, and say, what are the challenges? Are women discriminated against? If the answer is yes, what is it that needs to be done? to ensure that there is gender equality even at that level. There is no representation, there is no uh, treating of women as if they are minors who are incapable of taking their own decisions. So simply align the system in its entirety to the dictates of our constitution. I don't know how it can ever be said that that system is incapable of being changed to make that a practical reality. So your, your viewpoint, Chief Justice, is that you can amend the bill, whatever this bill is, sure. but you must situate this thing under the broader traditional uh, legal system that has been existing in rural areas and adapt it and align it to the new constitution. The constitution as the supreme law must breathe life into that system. Nothing about that system that is not aligned to the constitution must be allowed to live on. Okay, let's come back now to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Let's focus on that for a little while. I mean, there, there's vacancies there as well, sure. but broadly there's also been all kinds of concerns, for instance, around gender representation in that and how people are treated. What, in your view today, in 2019, is the state of the Supreme Court of Appeal of South Africa? The, the challenges um, that have been uh, related to me or relate to me in relate, uh, about the Supreme Court of Appeal are the following. That there are colleagues there who have made life unbearable for others. It is my understanding that uh, the president of that court is dealing with a situation. From time to time she briefs me about the developments and I've been given the assurance that she's on top of the situation. And for as long as the head of the court is on top of the situation, I dare not intervene as if he or she is incompetent. So it's a question of some personalities there. And from what I understand, they, they, are, they are not in excess of six who handle things in a manner 
that is uncollegial. And as, as soon as that situation, those colleagues uh, come to terms with the fact that they own nothing, they don't own the court, they are there as judges like any other, the better for that institution. Okay, let's come to your institution, the Constitutional Court. There have been some vacancies there. I think you're yes. busy trying to fill them. Yes. Currently, do you think this has compromised the work done by your court? No. I, I have had, I, I know that there are people who are writing and uh, almost seeking to create the impression that there's a crisis there. Remember, before you can be appointed to act as a Constitutional Court judge, there's a certain level of experience as a judge already that you must have. It's unlike before when the first judges were appointed, some of the people had not even practiced law at all. They had been lecturers. And, um, and, um, and some of the people had not had exposure to constitutional law before. Now, we take him from people who have practiced constitutional law as uh, attorneys and advocates who have already been judges. So by the time they act at the Constitutional Court, the experience is already there. They know what it is, uh, what it means, or what it entails to be a Constitutional Court judge. So you're satisfied currently with the setup there. Are there any tensions currently amongst yourselves in the Constitutional Court? No. We debate issues very robustly. We don't fake unity. We are very free people. We express ourselves fully. As, as fully as we should, but there are no tensions that I'm aware of. Okay. Have you gone beyond the, the, the concern that you didn't attend many sittings last year? Have you managed that, and how are you managing it? That thing is not a concern at all. And I, I think it's got to be contextualized, because uh, some of these things uh, could be misleading. I serve not just as Chief Justice, or as, as head of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, but I function also as the head of the whole judiciary of South Africa. And at the same time, I have been fulfilling the role of president of the highest court in the continent of Africa. And at some stage until, I think, February last year, I was the chairperson of the world body of constitutional uh, courts. Now, when you assume these responsibilities, you must mean to carry out what they come with. So, of immediate significance is that you require only eight judges to sit there. Two, my responsibilities, unlike all of my predecessors, have by far been extended even by my administrative responsibilities. You never had a fully fleshed office of the Chief Justice, which is at the level of a national department, requiring the guidance of the Chief Justice before I came in. It was at a, at a skeletal level when my predecessor left. Now, when I came in, it became a fully fleshed and functional department with its own budget. So people need pick, I think, particularly when they think the time has come to criticize you. There's no crisis there. There's no problem. I will continue to absent myself from court sittings as long as it's necessary to do so to take care of other responsibilities. What many people don't pay attention to is the following. There are serious challenges in continent, in the, in the judiciaries, some of the judiciaries in the continent of Africa, which required my attention. And I cannot, as president of the body, say, oh, what are they going to say if I absent myself from this or the other case? The system has been functioning well while I was attending to other responsibilities that required my attention. 25 years into our democracy, what else do you think needs to change in our judiciary to improve it? I, I think you need fully fledged institutional independence. I've been raising this issue for a long time. We don't agree with the executive. But the bottom line is... We are the only institution of state, especially the only arm of the state that is not institutionally independent. You need to have in place a system that does not allow the executive to have any role to play in the running of issues 
that are intimate to court operations. You never need to have a system where a court is established there, a court is established there, and the judiciary did not have any meaningful role to play in the conceptualization of that kind of a court. Now, if it's fully institutionally independent, it needs its own budget? Of course. It has its budget now, but under, under a national department format. And when it is um, a national department, it means the Minister of Justice must get involved. Now, that's not independent. The Minister of Justice or any minister, not even the President, has got to be involved in the administrative, uh, in the running of the administrative affairs. Okay, okay. currently, I know we're not there. That's what you think should be the best way forward. What are your relationship like with the executive, in particular with the Minister of Justice? Well, we relate well. Uh, our relationship is very much constitutionally compliant. Um, we, we don't have to be friends to, to, to serve the nation. There are tensions uh, between us occasionally, between us as the judiciary and the executive, typical of a healthy and vibrant democracy. Chief Justice Mukhe thank you very much. Thank you, sir.